go ahead, Elsie. There we go. All right. Well, good afternoon, everyone. We are honored that you've decided to join us this Wednesday afternoon, the last Wednesday of November. Hard to believe that time was just zooming on by. So let's just press pause. Let's just take a moment, take a breath, maybe close the eyes and just give thanks to um, whatever goodness is happening in your world, in your neck of the woods today. There's always something, always, always something to be thankful for. So we give thanks to Creator for the gift of this day. As the sun rose in the east, it was a reminder that, that we do not walk alone that we've been, get, we've been given another gift from Creator. And so we hope we're making the most of it today. And so we're here at Innovate BC. We welcome you that this is an opportunity to learn, to um, take in the knowledge that's being served to us today and an opportunity for to engage into, in some dialogue. So we're just thankful for this opportunity that we can meet here um, on this webinar, our beautiful Can Do family. Uh, today is Innovate BC. So we just pressed pause, took a deep breath, close the eyes, acknowledge the goodness that is in your life. So we say, thank you, creator. All right, so today's Innovate BC is in partnership with cooperatives. First, we got Trista, who is the Indigenous Di Relations Director, I believe. She is here. Uh, yeah, Director of Indigenous Relations um, with cooperatives first. And she's in Saskatchewan, but she's just here to cheer on our guest speaker. Um, and our guest speaker is Dave Moore, who's joining us from BC, uh, the great town of Kamloops. So we welcome you, Dave. So a little bit about what today's webinar is about. It is the River Select Fisheries Cooperative. So Dave is going to just inform us what's happening there. Um, this was incorporated in 2014 and it was uh, created by Business Cluster of Indigenous Community Fisheries in BC, who have decided to work together to streamline fishery logistics, processing, and marketing, making it more efficient for everyone to invest, invest in their local fisheries and grow into the value chain. You know, love collaboration, love partnership, love when people get together and bring their ideas and their good energy um, and their economics really together. So this fishery creates more value and sustainable, preserve local fish populations and to remain competitive with large scale fisheries. So the cooperative members are not only the fishers, but the fishing communities and their enterprises that support them. So the River Select Fisheries Cooperative is helping build vibrant and prosperous indigenous communities through local self-regulated and integrated fisheries businesses led by First Nations. So that is very, very important. I love to hear vibrant and prosperous indigenous communities. Love to hear that. Uh, so we're really delighted, honored, Dave, that you've decided to be with us this afternoon for a, about an hour. Um, I think the most captivating of your bio was at the very beginning that you have 43 years experience as a fishery technician and community development with more than 30 indigenous communities, organizations and their fisheries around the world. So we're bringing an expert to the table today. We're honored that you're here. Um, just a little bit of housekeeping, use that chat box throughout. Let us know where you're joining from. We always love to hear where our family's joining from from. Um, also throughout the presentation, feel free to put some questions in the chat box. And then there will be opportunity for more questions and, you know, dialogue at the end of today's presentation. Finally, this is my favorite thing to say um, after I introduce the, the guest speaker, but there will be an evaluation link sent to you at the end of today's presentation, and you will also get the copy of today's presentation as well. Now, with that evaluation link, we love to hear from you. We love your feedback. And when you fill that in, your, your name will be entered to win a draw, and we do the draw at the end of the month. 
for a $500 Visa gift card. So I think that's amazing. So we love to hear from you. Um, so fill out that evaluation link. All right, so enough about me, enough about my talking. Let's get down to business why we are here and passing this virtual mic off to you, Dave. Thank you very much, Michelle, and uh, to the Cooperative's first team. Uh, I'm honored to be here today. I'm gonna talk about um, uh, kind of an introduction, first of all, to our, our fisheries cooperative. Uh, it was uh, based in British Columbia. Its purpose, its origins, forms and functions and, and the outcomes. And I'll, I'll spend about 15 minutes doing that and then we'll have an opportunity for some questions and answers. <clears throat> so uh, can everybody hear me okay? Yes? Yes, okay, good. Uh, I was wondering for a second there. All right. So um, uh, my, my name is Dave Moore. I'm the business manager for the River Select Fisheries Cooperative and our, our program called Authentic Innovation, uh, in, Authentic Indigenous Seafood. Uh, tip of our hat to our program partners. Uh, we've been on quite a journey for the last couple of decades, uh, and uh, we certainly didn't do this to, uh, on our own. Um, as Michelle mentioned, um, uh, we've got uh, lots of partners, lots of people who put a lot of time and energy into uh, into making things work. So I appreciate uh, all of our, our, our support. There's a bit of a preamble. According to Fisheries and Oceans Canada, the annual value of Canada's seafood industry is an estimated $6.6 billion annually and employs 72,000 people. Indigenous fishing communities represent only about 2.5% of the income and 4.2% of the employment in Canada's fisheries. And that's primarily just through seasonal fishers. And we set out to change that. We do share a common problem. Global competition for limited seafood resources has marginalized many local fishing communities, threatening the survival of aquatic biological diversity, as well as the food and the livelihoods of indigenous communities who depend on their local fisheries. We incorporated in British Columbia uh, in 2014. Uh, we needed the scale of multiple fisheries to be able to compete in global seafood markets. The local decision making and branding is, is paramount to our identity and our function. Uh, the founding members representing 32 First Nations communities from five nations, the Okanagan or Silk, the Northern Sequetmik, the Carrier Sikani, Chilkoti and uh, Stolo. Uh, we, we, were, we were born uh, uh, out of the eight river fisheries that uh, came to the table to, to collaborate, uh, involving three founding commercial fishing enterprises owned and operated by Indigenous communities in British Columbia. We have five staff, a business manager, myself, production manager, a marketing manager, a co-op developer, uh, an accounting and inventory manager, and a, and a, and a variety of, of salaries and, and contract positions. We have five directors and includes an uh, executive director and treasurer. And all the directors are, are uh, indigenous or from the indigenous fishing enterprises. My uh, slideshow is moving slowly, there we go. So we started with River Branding. We organized, uh, we were organized by First Nations uh, uh, who, I mean, I had to open up some of my screen. We were organized by First Nations to help restore their salmon fisheries after 100 years of uh, being marginalized by a growing mechanized industry uh, in the Pacific Rim, Pacific region uh, in the early 1900s. Uh, our, our development has been supported by a modern policy shift to reduce marine mixed stock interception of salmon that was leading to the decline of stock diversity in British Columbia. Modern salmon fisheries needed to be more selective, targeting the most productive stocks and leaving the less productive stocks to spawn and to get back to their river origins and the, and the people who depended on them. Salmon stock diversity also provides the intraspecies vitality to withstand impacts like climate change. Bear with me for a couple of minutes and we'll give you a bit of a background video on that. Okay, this one. Yeah. Thank you. 
To save some of BC's endangered salmon species, we know we have to move a percentage of the salmon harvest from the marine fisheries on the coast towards in-river and lake areas where we can more accurately monitor the harvest of species that are at risk. I think one thing we could do is go to more terminal fisheries so we can have a better, a better picture of what's there and what isn't there. From that, we could look after the fish in a way because we could judge how much is coming back. The overfishing of these weaker, endangered stocks of salmon is a solvable problem. We need to harvest fewer fish in these marine mixed stock areas that happen along the coast and in the lower reaches of the larger river systems like the Skeena and the Fraser and move our harvests closer to the spawning grounds where we can actually focus on known healthier populations of salmon runs and reduce the damage to the endangered species. Because it's, it's what we do here. We, we, we live off of our fish here. All year round, we live off of our fish here. And if they get overfished, what is our grandchildren going to have, right? If we're going to protect the ecosystems of our rivers, lakes, and oceans, as well as the livelihood of the people who work them, if we want salmon to be part of our future, we have to change the way we fish. So our journey, I think, is a bit of a background to the origins of our journey. And, and many of us that built the cooperative were uh, involved in, in stock assessment, stock restoration work with First Nations around these major BC rivers before we got to the point where there was an opportunity to begin restoring some of the economic fisheries. The vision back then was to, to try and buy back some of these licenses that weren't operating because of um, harvest restrictions in the marine environment and to move them back to the rivers of origin, breaking them up into their constituent parts and fishing them in the places closer to where they come from. We spent about five years and some 27 First Nations led workshops to develop a vision document called River to Plate. And the purpose of that long dialogue was to get a better understanding of if First Nations wanted to move forward with uh, commercialization of their fisheries and how they wanted to move forward. Uh, in the early days, uh, the, the chiefs of the Fraser River, for example, weren't even sure they wanted to commercialize their fisheries. In many of their minds, there was a an opinion that, uh, and a valid one, that um, the, the decline and the loss, in fact, of some of their, their local fisheries in the headwaters of some of these major river systems was caused by the industrialization of fisheries. So our original vision was to promote the inland salmon fisheries, the river fishing cultures, and the high quality, natural, wholesome salmon that's produced as certifiably sustainable, healthy, and good value. We built a code of conduct for responsible trade, respecting the care, the handling, and the welfare of the salmon foremost, reflecting the sound stewardship and food safety in the fishery above all. We call that our charter for responsible trade. And out of our charter, we created a society called the Inland Salmon Producers Association to build methods and standards, things like best practices, monitoring, traceability, certification, brand stewardship, that kind of thing. And then we created the River Slack Fisheries Cooperative for the business side of our, our growing uh, vision. Uh, things like logistics, business planning, marketing and sales. And we work for the commercial fishing enterprises, both members and clients. We worked our way through the myth that salmon caught from the, uh, from the rivers in British Columbia are of poor quality. And we began to change the way people looked at uh, the river fishery. 
and and that that wasn't always people that were concerned about the uh, about whether these fish were were edible and, and valuable, but it also meant we needed to create uh, controls and systems so that they weren't uh, improperly exploited, weren't weren't um, uh, driven into worse problems. Uh, some of the early fisheries were were entirely just targeting the caviar and uh, developing large international export markets for caviar. And, and the carcasses, when I first began this work, I was seeing piles of carcasses five feet high on the gravel bars all over the lower Fraser River. And people said, well, they're only good for their caviar. We, we, we decided we needed to change that. So we developed our shared brand and our brand was about uh, uh, promoting the locally branded river wild salmon from indigenous communities around the province. Our first cluster of fisheries, uh, as I mentioned, were from the major rivers around British Columbia. We developed their logos and their labels and their brand identities with them. We, we hired graphic artists and, and marketers and began to put together a program that would help promote and, and develop the fisheries and the, the products that would best represent those fisheries, emphasizing that these were by design, sustainable, selecting only the strong stocks and protecting the, the, the food security and the culture of, of the, the communities uh, where these salmon come from, uh, uh, above all. We developed standardized labeling that made the, met the needs of the Canadian Food Inspection Agency so we could uh, access markets uh, domestically, but also to, uh, to meet standards for extra export markets so that uh, we had um, maximum uh, market access for the, our products. Uh, in the bottom left-hand corner of the, uh, the label, you'll see a QR code. Uh, it says, trace this fish. It provides the opportunity for our, our uh, customers to find out where their food comes from. By scanning the QR code, it gives a guarantee of the origins of the fishery, the, the First Nations fishing enterprise, where they were harvested, who was involved in that enterprise, what those fisheries were like, uh, their, their, their story behind those fisheries, their conservation stories, and and their, their art and, and uh, their history and uh, uh, the kinds of things that would bring a better understanding to the consumers of, of where their food was coming from, where their seafood was coming from. The, uh, there's a link from the, uh, from the guarantee uh, that, that brings the people to the customers to, um, to these stories. And there's a framework that provides uh, a background on our our uh, river branded uh, products that link the markets to our, the, those local fisheries, things like the location and the most significant feature of the fishery, the mission, traditions, uh, and so forth. We began developing uh, uh, a variety of project uh, products uh, um, under a, initially a, a frozen format, things like fillets and wild candied salmon, smoked salmon and caviar, that kind of thing. We began to expand then into shelf stable products, uh, retorts and, and uh, cans and dried and, and that kind of thing. We began innovating to try and, and provide a, a kind of, the kinds of products that would best reflect the, the traditional foods and the traditional ways of preparing uh, these unique um, products from uh, the communities and the, the fisheries of origin. We uh, collaborated around um, and, and with, in a partnership with DFO, we, we uh, uh, rebuilt the historic Nelson Brothers Cannery into a logistics center. We kept the original sign and, and adopted the name Paramount Fisheries in Steveston Harbor in Vancouver. Uh, this uh, provided us a springboard to access, uh, access the markets. Uh, as uh, it's, it's about 12,000 square feet of, uh, of logistics, uh, about half of that is freezer uh, cold storage and the other half is uh, secure dry storage. And we contract the operation of that facility out to a company called Organic Ocean. And uh, whenever our space isn't being used, uh, Organic Ocean uses that space. So we've got a, a really good uh, joint venture going with them. The interesting uh, note on, on this particular piece of our puzzle was that uh, it took us a few years to get the processing companies in British Columbia to, to work with us um, and to see that we weren't necessarily competition. And uh, as, the, as their fisheries began to decline uh, as well, uh, they had processing space available so that they were more and more open to processing our, 
our custom processing our products for us and applying our labels and so forth. But where they drew the line was they weren't going to store our products and they certainly weren't going to market our products and they certainly were not going to distribute our products uh, products to the marketplace. So uh, this particular pilot uh, has been the most one of our most significant steps forward and we're looking to to encouraging others to develop uh, such facilities across the country. A big piece of what we do is um, is financing these fisheries. Fishing communities generally lack the cash flow to buy their own fish catch from, the, from their own fishers catch. The banks won't lend cash for fish purchases. And uh, the return on investment takes up to three years after value adding versus a cash purchase, which most fishing communities are used to for the fresh catch. And so that's, that's a, a significant departure from the contemporary um, fish trade uh, around the world. And so we needed community economic development enterprises working at the community levels to take the risk and the burden from the fishers um, that, that tended to prefer the quick cash. So we've been encouraging these commercial fishing enterprises to work with their local economic development enterprises and, uh, and to provide the cash flow and the support to value add, to cover the value add costs and to, to hold the investment over the next year to two years before all of the return on investment has come to fruition. Uh, our own members equity was used originally uh, and to date, uh, but uh, we're beginning to develop more uh, flexible models where we can uh, have a more scalable system of securing loans uh, to support these, uh, these First Nations fisheries. Uh, one of the, the most interesting things that we did early on in our development was um, supply chain engineering, price, uh, price mapping, uh, value chain mapping, and uh, it's, it's sort of one of the first and most fundamental steps in, in, in getting into the value chain. And so uh, when we, we initially work with the community and their fishery, the first thing we do is we profile their fishery. We begin to, to uh, advise on products uh, that they can develop with their, with their, uh, with their harvest. And uh, it gives the opportunity for the community to see the whole value chain. So there's an opportunity to invest up the value chain and uh, move beyond just the uh, the harvest, or in this case, uh, you can see at the top of the the uh, the pyramid here is the the procurement. And through that value chain, you can see there's uh, the landing, uh, what what is spent on landing costs, the processing, production logistics, the wholesale markup, everything all the way to um, the manufacturer uh, 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 sales. Uh, the uh, sorry, MSRP, the recommended uh, uh, retail price for a, a sockeye fillet uh, today is uh, well, when this was done was about twenty dollars. With that information, we then began to engineer the product uh, and the pricing. And as we worked our way through these things, we we're able to look at comparable products and and if we're under or over, to be able to make adjustments. But all along the value chain, there's a lot of moving parts. So we've developed business models that enabled us to, to model out the outcomes as we, uh, we tried different products and uh, different markets. The, the, uh, the models generate a dashboard, which you were just seeing, that was a sort of generic dashboard. Within that model is a central sort of a piece that helps the, the fishing enterprise see the total cost of their fishery, the total sales, the profit, profit margins, the investment, uh, return on investment and so forth. As uh, a, a key part of our growth as well, we wanted to move away from the, the somewhat dysfunctional uh, trade environments uh, that involved brokers and buyers that were knocking on doors in our communities in the middle of the night with suitcases of cash and, and trying to coerce people to sell their fish to them. And what we found is that there was a lot of conflict between fishermen, between fishers' families, between even communities. And we wanted to find a way to, to change that. So we developed the Sustainable Seafood Market Cooperative. The, the key to the Market Cooperative is an online bidding platform that enables uh, us to, to put forward the available production, sometimes in advance of the fishery so they can be bid on. Uh, we register currently about 300 companies and bid on the process. Uh, we register, as I say, about 300 companies now. Uh, we put out a, a, a product offering that, that shows a picture of the product, uh, uh, identifies where it was caught, who was caught, 
uh, again, guaranteeing it comes from a, a licensed fishery, all of those kinds of things. There's a set amount of time for companies to submit their bids. Uh, upon the deadline, we review the bids, summarize them, and then present them to the local community fishing enterprise, who then takes the, uh, uh, has the, has the, the uh, opportunity then to choose which buyer they prefer. So they still are in control of who they're selling to, but this provides a, a greater degree of transparency and uh, a more competitive approach and more transparent approach than, than um, having show up, somebody show up your door with a, a suitcase full of cash and a, and a big smile. <clears throat> Early uh, in our development, as I mentioned, um, we were focused on the salmon fishery, but declining river salmon fisheries could not sustain the co-op alone, leading us to expansion into marine fisheries and new clients, indigenous clients across Canada. I've got a picture here of uh, Pangertongue Fisheries. This is one of our, our most um, uh, farthest reaching client in, uh, on Baffin Island. Pangertongue Fisheries is an amazing indigenous community with a, a very significant fishery. They're, they fish 1. some 1.2 million pounds of turbot through a kilometer of, of, of uh, ocean, uh, through two meters of uh, ocean ice. And they hand line these fish up through the ice. They built their own processing plant. And for years they were, they were selling to international markets, uh, wholesale commodity markets, the raw material. But they began uh, to, to build a vision to, to, um, to value add their products, to brand their products and to sell them to, to domestic markets and uh, increase the value. They were exporting a lot of raw material for somebody else to, to, uh, to invest in, very similar to, uh, to everybody else that we've been working with. So we conducted feasibility studies as we began to shift our, our journey to um, authentic indigenous seafood. And uh, to demonstrate that our work was relevant, uh, we found that, it, it, that our work was relevant in the Arctic and the Atlantic and central Canada's big lakes as, as, as it was here in the Pacific region and, and, and for the same reasons. Seafood was being harvested and sold to global commodity markets in raw form to other, for others to invest in. The status quo was supporting seasonal fishers and incentivizing more and more intensive fishing, just like in the salmon fishery. Some call it the race to the bottom as everybody's chasing slim profit margins and having to fish more fish to try and make a living, even if it was a seasonal living at that. It was replacing food, cultural and economic security with quick cash, undervaluing the resource and sometimes even harming local fish ecosystems. Our business model, it turned out, worked everywhere. Our feasibility study uh, identified uh, most indigenous communities uh, were in fact employing seasonal fishers. And uh, we found 87 indigenous commercial fishing enterprises across Canada, six fish processing plants, usually a joint venture, but there were some small seasonal uh, fish plants operated, uh, owned and operated by First Nations. Uh, we found 18 of the 87 reported value adding and branding. Um, but we found when we began to look at uh, look for inventories, uh, only five were active uh, or had some inventory in the last year, and only three and three of those were our own. So we felt that there was um, a, certainly a market uh, for our uh, for us to expand into, and concluded that most of the indigenous harvest was being sold to commodity export markets in its raw form, and communities didn't have the capacity or the opportunities, so the cash flows, whatever it took, to invest in their own fisheries. And we wanted to change that. Our updated business goal is to develop shared supply chains and market access for authentic indigenous seafoods and assist community investment into their fisheries, including the infrastructure necessary to optimize the environmental, economic, and social viability of their fisheries. Some of the benefits of local branding and value adding of these indigenous fisheries and includes fostering a, a local stewardship and ecological and ecological sustainability by protecting local fish populations, habitats and fishing cultures just as they have for thousands of years. It enhances profits and viability of the local fishing enterprise. Uh, and it um, provides more profits, uh, requiring less fish to uh, reduce pressure on local aquatic ecosystems. It improves the trade environment, less conflict, better working conditions, et cetera. And, uh, and promotes, uh, protects the food, culture, and economic security of, of these fisheries. Looking forward, uh, Authentic Indigenous Seafood is currently our program. I suspect in the next uh, 
18 months, we'll see a shift of our, our corporate identity from River Select to authentic indigenous seafood. We've been averaging about 30% growth annually as a cooperative. Uh, we supply major restaurants in Vancouver, Toronto, and Hong Kong currently. We have retail markets. Uh, uh, that's our fastest growing sector. Negoti we've been negotiating export markets for our surplus um, value-added products, replacing commodity markets uh, for raw materials with locally branded indigenous um, seafood products. Our supply chain collaboration is expanding across Canada, adding new locally branded fisheries every year. But we're promoting regional producer cooperatives at the gateway to Canada's major commercial fisheries, as I mentioned, in the Arctic and the Atlantic and Central Canada, and local cooperatives, fishers cooperatives in the communities where these fisheries really operate. We don't want to become a big centralized company in Canada. What we're looking for is to develop the capacities for Indigenous communities to, to define their own vision, their own way forward, and to, to follow uh, the lead of, of these initial uh, activities to try and build value into their fisheries and sustain their fisheries and, and look after their fisheries. And finally, to continue to foster this return to more local artisanal fisheries as a solution to overfishing of global seafood resources. That's it. Thank you. Oh, we thank you so much, Dave, for your presentation. Um, I have a comment here in the chat box. Too many tasty looking pictures of salmon treats. His mouth is still watering. <laughs> and so he's saying thank you for the presentation. Um, really good presentation. Uh, we're going to open it up, everybody, for any questions that you might have. Feel free to unmute yourself. Feel free to put it in the chat box. Um, it was really interesting. I, I particularly like, and I wrote it down, I liked what you had to say. To, it's about developing capacities for Indigenous communities. And I think that that's, that's important. It's um, kind of building on what's there and just helping and supporting um, you know, this, this market, which is so excellent. So any questions out there? So there's a few questions about why, why would it be important? Why choose a co-op? <laughs> that is an excellent question. Um, in fact, as, as we hired uh, co-op developers, and, and I mentioned uh, we had had some uh, partner sponsors, Van City was one of our early sponsors. Uh, they took us under the wing. Uh, and frankly, you're, 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 if you're a co-op bank, you're nobody if you don't have a pet fisheries cooperative. <laughs> and Van City has been just wonderful to us. Uh, they've helped us from uh, our, you know, the sparkle in our eye, our initial idea at the beginning. And they, they hired a, 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 one of the best co-op developers in the country, and actually a, a couple of them. And uh, they helped us think through whether and how we wanted to commercialize our fisheries. What would the businesses look like? And, and they presented all kinds of different business models, but, but the one that resonated most with our indigenous leaders was a co-op model. In fact, um, in other words, uh, indigenous communities are probably close to a co-op model than any other kind of business model. Okay, so how has the co-op changed things for the members? I think that that's really important, the membership and what are some of the, 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 the good things that have rose out of this? Sure, well, one of the most first, most significant things was the co-op enabled uh, a number of communities to work together to pay for the, the organization of the logistics and the business planning support and, and the, uh, the tools and the, the, the service accounts and all of those things you need to organize, prepare, to, to move into the value chain. Uh, in the absence of that, one small scale fishery in a remote community has a really hard time ascending into that value chain and doing all of these things themselves. And so uh, one by one, uh, and uh, they're, they're all susceptible to, to that, that broker that shows up at their door with a suitcase full of, of uh, money and uh, that's promoting the best deal they're ever gonna get. And, and really what they're doing is they're buying these, uh, these fish at, at, um, at rock bottom prices. 
And the only way some of these communities have access to, to move their fish from the river bank or the lake bank or the, or the ocean bank is, is um, uh, they need the totes and the ice and the trucks. They need to get them to a processor within hours and then the processor uh, from the processor and into products and packaging, all of those things, it's just too much for a small fishing enterprise. And so over the last hundred years, the industry has given rise to these vertically integrated companies that own and control everything except the harvesting itself. So often these big fish companies own the licenses, they own the boats, they practically own the fishermen. And it leaves very little opportunity for the community to break loose and get control over their fishery and, and get, get, get um, squeeze more value and, and more benefit out of the value chain. Mm, I see. One thing I liked about your presentation was um, that QR code. I, did, was it track your fish and that you could go and see the, the history? I just thought that was really great. Really great. So what would be some of the upcoming goals for the co-op? If you could let us know, give us some insights. Yeah, really, really good question. Our, our biggest uh, work right uh, effort right now is to develop a share system and to open up our membership. And, and the reason for the share system is, as I mentioned, uh, it was, it's a bit of a nuance in our business plan, but, but securing the financing to support these communities to, to invest in their own fisheries. I mean, they've got to buy the fish from their fishermen. The fishermen uh, have a hard enough time paying for their gear and their boat and the gas and the food and, and everything to get ready for a fishery. And then they take all of the risk. And so... It, it was inappropriate. We found time and again, it was inappropriate to expect the fishermen to just hang on just 18 months and you'll get your money back. It just didn't work that way. And, and sometimes buyers will, will provide kind of an incentive, something they call a bonus once they've sold all the fish. And, and many of the buyers promised this. And, and uh, in, in many occasions, we found the buyers never showed up again. And so we've, we've been using our members to to secure the loans that we needed in order to finance the fisheries. But as we grew to a point of, um, you know, we started to grow out of our clothes, if you will, we couldn't uh, afford to finance any more fisheries. And so we needed more tools. So we've been in discussions with Van City about ways of doing that, but um, it's been our co-op developers that have been creating for us a share system and the share system as it, as it stands, and it's, it's still in a work in progress, but we should have this out the door within the next few months, uh, involves two types of shares. Uh, one type of share is um, as we develop the products and the markets, we're getting pretty strong market pull, and uh, we, we, we buy the raw materials from the community fishery. We design their logos, labels, packages, all those things I described. They own their brand but we finance their fishery, we, we purchase their raw materials, we invest in all of the products and out comes the other side are these, these market ready, customer ready products. Now, if the community, typically what happens is uh, a community will watch for two or three years. And we're at that stage now where the communities are, are looking at our, and, and we show them the business models. They, they also own the business models that I was showing you with the data that keeps uh, ref getting refreshed with each year's fishery. So really valuable, really detailed insights into how the economics of their fisheries work, which, which is something else brokers and buyers will never provide to an indigenous community. So they'll watch for two or three years typically. And then what, what we're seeing is they're coming back to us and saying, hey, we want some of that. We want, how do we get a share of our fishery? We say, well, it's the first and foremost principle is it's yours if you want it. And if, if, you, if, you can, if you wanna buy 50% of the cost of bringing it to the market ready, uh, market ready product stage, then you get 50% of the products that come out of that market. And so they're loving that because they then have the flexibility. They wanna buy 5% or 10 or 50 or, or 100%. They always have the first choice. And if, if, um, if there's a shortfall in the financing, we now have a tool so that other fishing enterprises can buy the difference. And that's working really well. For example, for the Upper Fraser uh, Fisheries Conservation Alliance, they have a, a fishing enterprise called UFish. And UFish has been restricted in fishing for oh, going on four years now because of the collapse of the, uh, in the Fraser Canyon. 
uh, and, and the inability for many of the salmon stocks to get upstream uh, without a lot of investment and help to get them there. Now the populations are starting to rebuild, but youth fish hasn't been able to have a harvest in four years. And so this model has given them the ability to invest in another fishery in some other place where they, they see good profit margins and a good return on their investment. The second kind of, of uh, investment share we're building is uh, a share of the fishery. So uh, many of our community fisheries have a lot of moving parts to them. And they may not be, of course, just salmon, they may involve uh, cod or you know, ground fish or you know, a variety of species. And so when we, when we uh, invest in a fishery, we're investing in all of these moving parts, all of these pieces with all range of profit margins. And so when we summarize all of that, there's a, a sort of summary profit margin there. So they, they have the ability and an interest in, in investing in that, that fishery as a whole, as opposed to just buying a product. And with the same principle, if they invest in 50% of the value of the, of the uh, producing the fishery, then they can get 50%, they would get 50% of the profits of that fishery. And what's really interesting about this piece of the story that's not immediately obvious is when we did our, our uh, feasibility study a couple of years ago, almost three years ago now, um, we were coming back to the communities where we were doing the, the business profiling and modeling. And we'd say, all right, we've got your model ready. Here's, here's what we've discovered. And we're looking at 30 to 45% profit margins where they were always losing money in the past from the raw, just selling the raw material. And uh, they would go, it's really interesting. We really like that. Boy, you guys have done excellent work. Uh, we love this, but um, we're not really sure our chiefs are ready to make the investment right now. And so we kind of went back uh, to the drawing board and said, now what do we do? Uh, we're pulling our hair out, like, what, what, what could be wrong? What are we doing wrong? And then we thought, you know what? If the community can't afford or isn't ready to take the risk, why don't we offer to do it for them? We make sure still that it's their brand, it's their products, everything. They own everything except the, the, the product that we produce until they buy it. And so that gives them the opportunity, as I said earlier, to, to watch, to see how it unfolds, to build the confidence after two or three years. And, and as we build the markets, um, they start to build that confidence with us. And, and, and so it's through that process that we came to this conclusion that, that um, we really need this kind of financing machine uh, in place so that um, uh, indigenous communities have the opportunity to invest in their fishermen and their fisheries. Thank you. Before I ask my final question, anybody else want to come on in and ask a question? Yes, Ken, I've got a question. Um, uh, just uh, the final price of $19. Now, if there, if that salmon or a portion of that salmon was converted to a canning operation, would that reduce that, that price? Um, and would that be a, of a benefit to the seller or to the, um, the fisheries or the fishers? Uh, the, uh, the the fishermen um, um, because they're only getting uh, three dollars as as I read that pyramid three dollars to nineteen dollars that's a big spread so would a canning operation number one uh, be able to get um, less waste um, and uh, uh, reduce the, the final selling price um, and I realize that may not be one of the goals I mean uh, so anyway uh, actually just a question. thanks and um, it's actually an excellent question and it's it's what we're all about. Um, I, I, sh I uh, just going back to so folks might might uh, want to recall this this uh, this value chain graph here, uh, and the answer is yes. In fact, um, when we build these models uh, that I was showing, bring to the front here. There it is. So this is a generic model. I kind of fuzzed it a bit because it is confidential information from uh, one of our indigenous fisheries. And when we build these models, we have. Uh, the whole range of products that may be produced are considered at the initial stage of profiling the fishery. Once we've assessed the fishery, the different kinds of, of uh, uh, raw materials that are being produced, we then look then at the different products which could be produced from that fishery. And then we engineer into the business model the revenues and expenses so that the community can make an informed choice whether they want to, you know, maybe they still want to sell it all as headed and gutted frozen product or, uh, you know, as opposed to just selling a whole round or, or maybe they want to make fillets or, 
Um, we, uh, maybe they want to make uh, a smoke can product or one of our most popular products, uh, popular selling products these days is a shelf stable candied salmon. And uh, it sells really well, it markets really well because it's shelf stable and, and small stores and gas stations are now displaying it uh, you know, on their countertops. And so uh, given our experience and our market poll, we're able to show the fishing enterprises the range of the products and, and uh, pluck out those products that are best suited to their fishery. And then they make the choice, the business choice, which products. And often it's not just one. Um, and it's particularly uh, of interest is it's the products that are the least valuable that are making the most money. I know that that's counterintuitive, but for our team, when people start talking about fresh ocean bright Chinook and sockeye, we want to go running screaming into the hills. The profit margins are really slim. The world, the global seafood markets has become uh, unduly enamored with the whole idea of fresh fish. And so they're buying fresh fish at these, at a, in a competitive exorbitant price level from fishermen for a very short period of time. Then they're shipping them to Seattle or sometimes to Japan. And it's really hard on, on fisheries. It's hard on fishermen. It's hard on supply chains. And, you know, somewhere in Japan, somebody's eating a Chinook salmon caught on the coast of British Columbia three days earlier that is not ecologically sustainable. And so we not only advise on price points and profit margins, but we advise on things that are, are responsible trade, how to best utilize and invest in their fishery to utilize or generate the products that are gonna produce the, the best outcomes for their fishery. And if it happens to be fillets, uh, it's fillets, but, um, uh, what we've done is we gravitated towards, you saw our, our early origins were about these terminal river salmon fisheries where everybody thought the fish were inet uh, inedible. Now, we're, we're buying these fish at, at um, remarkably low prices. Uh, we're investing in them and getting 30 to 45% profit margins in a fresh salmon if you can handle those complex supply chains and, and you can keep fishermen alive long enough to, to beat them up to supply these short-term fisheries and keep them around. Um, the profit margins are, as you can see uh, from the, the value chain there, are really slim. And so the final sort of, sort of nuance in your question was, was how do the fishermen get these other profits? Well, it's important to see that the, that the fishermen, pardon me, there's the fisherman there, say $3 a pound, that's for a, for a, a fresh round sockeye. Um, there's a little slim piece in there, there's not a number there to go with it, but that's the landing cost. And each of these are incremental numbers. This isn't a cost for processing. You can see that the price went, the cost of this fish went from $3 to $8.65 from processing. And you can see the bulk of that is the processing cost. And then above that is the production logistics. That's getting it from the processor through in packaging and labeling and, and all of those kinds of things. And then there's the wholesale markup, which covers the cost in our case of, of the co-op. Then there's the storage and handling. There's almost a dollars worth of storage and handling. There's broker fees, marketing fees. As a fisherman, you can't say, sorry, I'm not going to pay a broker to, to sell this. I'm not going to pay for storage and handling. You can't get rid of any of these things. And so what we do is we, 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 we design the, the final products, which does have a profit margin in it. And as I mentioned then, I mean, if the fisherman can afford to wait 18 months and invest all this money to get to here, then they get the profit margin that goes with it. So our job is to, to help the communities get as far up this value chain as possible. And, and as they look at this, this, this value chain, and in this area here, some folks are saying, look at the amount of, of, of uh, uh, income that's coming out of this or uh, from, this, from this fish. And they say, we want to invest, therefore, in a processing plant, if they've got enough people to, to provide the labor in the processing plant. Or, you know, we want to develop a, a storage and handling facility because there's a buck there. And then you, you've got to do the, the, the business modeling to figure out, you know, there may be a dollar's worth of, of um, value in the storage and handling for every pound, but uh, how much of that is gonna disappear in the cost of the warehouse and the, the heat, the power, the light, the, the labor and all of those things. 
So it's not a matter of, of just how do the fishermen get $19 and 64 cents, uh, although they can if they developing all of the totes and the ice machines and landing and the pro bioprocessing plants and manage all the labels of the packaging and the distribution. They've got to do all of those things to get $19 and 64 cents for a fillet of sockeye. Thank you. It was just the, the thought that um, um, $19 is a lot to pay for. Well, not a, not a, 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 a there isn't a pound in a, a fish in a can, but it's um, uh, a lot of those costs can be reduced if you put them into a can real early. And I realize that canned uh, salmon is not like fresh or smoked uh, uh, frozen uh, salmon. So uh, I was talking about those pictures and my mouth watering. Uh, yeah, you don't get that from canned salmon, but a lot of those costs, you're not gonna pay uh, anywhere near $19 a pound for canned salmon. So, but, but you'll, you'll process a lot more. You won't waste as much uh, if you put them quickly into a can. Yeah, what we find is that um, I deplore cans. Um, canning is one of the worst ways to to um, to present uh, fish to the market to make it market ready. It's kind of like a really good example is uh, have you ever gone to a, a pop machine and and I oh, I don't want to drink that. I'll buy one of those Coca Colas or Pepsi's or Seven Up. There's too much sugar in it. Oh, there's a bottle of water. Wait a minute. I'm ha I'm have to pay two dollars for a bottle of water and I pay two dollars here for a can of Pepsi. What's wrong with this picture? It's because it's all about the can. And so when we talk about ecological or environmental sustainability or environmental responsibility, putting salmon into a can is, is in, in our opinion, not, not, not the most environmentally sustainable way of, of bringing salmon to the market. But uh, the unique thing about a can is it's shelf stable for years. And you won't find many of our products uh, raw, sorry, Many of our salmon, uh, natural salmon in a can because uh, their price points are somewhere between six and eight dollars a can. And so when you see canned salmon at two dollars in uh, Walmart or something, you're seeing um, uh, salmon that's been purchased out of Russia or somewhere else. And it's, it's driving that ecosystem to extinction. You can't afford to put salmon into a can uh, at two dollars a can. And so uh, we encourage through our, our, um, our price engineering, our modeling, as we, we show the communities these prices, we encourage them to, to, in get in to help that inform their choices. And, and so a, a really good example of that is, is a lot of our, our, our communities are switching to retort. You saw them in the packages earlier. Retort is simply a, a foil package that, uh, where's our retort? There it is. That's a retort package right there. It's just like a can only it's a lot cheaper to produce, flexible, it's lighter, and it hasn't got the environmental footprint of a tin can. Thank you very much for taking me through that journey. It was, uh, it was just, a, it was just a, one of those things to get in your mind and it sticks in your mind and say, well, damn it, you, know, you, can get, you can get a lot more value and you, don't, you won't throw as much away. Stick it in a can as quickly as possible and a lot of those downstream costs won't be there. But uh, thank you for, for the journey. You're welcome. Yeah, thank you for that really good um, answer and explanation. That that was really great. Thank you. Um, so today we had talked about co-ops. Um, Trista's here from the cooperatives first. We have Dave who was talking about the River Select Fisheries co co Cooperative. Um, so in the chat box, Trista, I don't know if you all noticed, but Trista had put her email address, her contact information. And she's like, if you have an idea for a co-op in any industry. So today what we were talking in the fishery industry, um, shoot her an email just to like have a conversation. I think that that's really um, great offer that you put out there, Trista. Uh, so thank you so much. It doesn't appear that there are any more questions. I mean, you walked us through, I think, some of the benefits of why a co-op for its members. You talked about some of those challenges as well, um, which were some of those last questions that we had. Uh, so I think you covered a lot of ground today, Dave. Um, thank you so much for your time, um, for being here and, and giving us a little insight into this industry, this very important industry. So, you know, in the chat box, a wonderful presentation. Um, so 
Heather, we'll see you next time. Thanks for joining us. All right. So thank you, everybody. Trista, any last words? No, I want to thank everybody uh, for attending. Thank you, Dave. Thank you, Tando and Innovate BC. Um, I'm re really excited uh, for meeting everybody. And um, for those who are unfamiliar with Cooperatives First, uh, we are a business development organization focused on building cooperatives. I am the Indigenous Relations Lead, so I uh, work with groups throughout Western Canada, um, both within um, First Nations, Métis, uh, even um, rural communities. So if you have an idea or any questions and just, um, we also have training available, uh, governance training, uh, incorporation support, business support, anything to help get your co-op off the ground. Uh, you just wanna to talk to an expert or get some ideas, uh, give us a call or email me. Uh, my email is in the chat or um, it's, I can be reached at trista at cooperativesfirst.com. So thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, thanks so much to have you here, Trista. Um, that was just poor grammar. Thank you so much for being here, Trista. We honor, you know, all that you do and all that you support. So there's Dave's information. So if you feel like you have any, you know, questions, um, any comments, you know, shoot him a message, shoot him an email. So, because that's what this journey is all about. This is learning from one another. It's building our own capacity, to talking about some of our ideas, um, asking questions is so important. So you have two amazing people in, in this co-op industry who could really answer any questions that you might have. So thank you all for joining us this afternoon. It got dark over here in Edmonton and Miskwichima Sky again. So I hope wherever you are, I hope the rest of your day goes well and that you just take a moment, stand outside, stand on the land, be with Mother Earth, just find that good connection. Um, be well, everybody, and we'll see you next time. Take care. Thank you.